I got low. I didn't see an end, so I put a bullet in my mouth, and the other guy spit it out. When I'm catcalled in the street? When incompetent men explain my own area of expertise to me, I... If I don't, I will get called emotional. You know, I tried. When I had the gauntlet, the stones, I, I really tried to bring her back. I miss him, man. Or difficult, or I might just literally get murdered. That's my secret, Cat. I'm always angry. <laughs> I'm an expert at controlling my anger because I do it infinitely more than you. <laughs> a couple of qualifiers before we begin. I am not, as you may have noticed, a woman, except on the occasional Saturday and only for money these days. I'm also not straight and so I've never really had that much use for them. But this lack of transactional relations is actually quite a good thing, because I'm also much less likely to commodify women. I was also, until a few years ago, a fashionable lefty student trot until I learned things, but I retained some slight fondness for some of the older forms of feminism, so if you came here expecting me to take a massive green dump on She-Hulk for reasons of gender politics, eh, well, actually, you probably won't be disappointed, but I was never going to dismiss it because of my gender politics. I don't have any. Politicians of both genders are invariably and equivalently shit. I love politics, and sex is all right, but that doesn't mean you should mix them. Rather and instead, it will be because of the show's gender politics without which it really wouldn't exist. And my position is that if I actually were a woman and a feminist, I think I would be more insulted by She-Hulk than I am as a titanically well-endowed chap, because She-Hulk reduces both women and feminism to the most shallow, cheap, tawdry, and superficial considerations. More than that, and because there is or should be more to talk about than its boilerplate middle-class single woman gripes, it's as though She-Hulk exists to prove Christopher Hitchens right. Women aren't funny. Now, it should be mentioned that his argument was never that there are no funny women, but rather that women who are funny are invariably emulating or playing to male standards of humor. I say the problem with female comedians up till now is they tend to be either uh, dykes, or Jews, or Butch. Thus, the issue isn't women individually, but womanness per se. Because, while men need to be funny if they are to have a chance to get laid, women are quite attractive enough, apparently, without making their menfolk titter. And if I were to add my own observations, while women trying to make men laugh will, to the extent they are successful, mimic male styles of humour, women producing comedy for women, or what we can loosely call feminist humour, have nothing to compare themselves to and no compunction to learn or, indeed, to be funny. Which is why comedians of this sort don't tell jokes, but rather repeat whatever gripe they are mildly annoyed about that day in a bid to elicit not laughs but sympathy and comradeship. And because it is all so self-indulgent and self-referential and petty, it makes the average male viewer want to sandpaper his own balls, and so presumably to feminise himself to the point where the pay gap lol Period tax, lol, mansplaining, lol, chauvinist pigs, lol, and Amy Schumer's patented vagina becomes something you can not laugh at but share in. Hey, girls are funny, Wendy, okay? Get over it. Just do women's comedy stuff, you know, talk about how fat you are and how you want to have sex with guys and then say, my vagina, a lot. I don't feel like being funny right now. And that's just the kind of sexist bullcrap that's going to keep you in the kitchen. Sit your ass down. I make no comment as to the innate comedy of Amy Schumer's vagina, which may or may not be something you want to share in. I haven't seen it, thankfully, so I couldn't possibly say. This kind of humour isn't social commentary. Much of the best humour is social commentary. But rather it is social bitching, griping, complaining. I'd probably disagree with Hitchens up to a point, because women who actually have real lives and serious thoughts and concerns and opinions can do social commentary just about as well as the men can and can probably thus do intelligent humour. Class plays as important a role as gender, to use my old Marxist terminology. 
But the vast majority of feminist comedians of the type who've written She-Hulk do not have real lives and serious thoughts and concerns and opinions because they are comfortably upper-middle-class suburbanites whose stories are incredibly dull and who have gained many more advantages from their sex than they have suffered hardships, which broadly maps the decline of modern feminism from something daring, intelligent, and genuinely transgressive and philosophical to a movement of well-paid, thoughtless media stars whose ideal of social strife is petty and vindictive and minuscule, an attempt to feminize common complaints about behavior and etiquette, for example, like being patronized, which is one of those things women really are very good at themselves. As though this is some great transgression by men against the fairer sex that betrays men's brutish and universal pig ignorance at the expense of the poor, long-suffering, mega-rich female class of so-called entertainers. None of this matters, none of this means anything, none of this is a serious issue, it doesn't even rise to the level of sexism. Again, women are just as impolite and patronizing and egotistical as men. None of it is radical or thoughtful, it is just petty, vindictive, pointless and uninteresting. And more often than not, it's plain wrong. See every argument ever made about the pay gap, for example. Had She-Hulk been written by, say, a working class woman, or an aging wife with a fat, boozing husband, its jokes would have been A. More cutting, B. More sympathetic, C. More ironic, and D. Funnier. But instead, it was written by professional singletons with excruciatingly well-paid jobs who would rather gripe about the partner of their law firm making more than his female secretary, such a pressing and universal concern, than about the actual and real plight and experiences of most women. Like, for example, the fact that secretary could well be on a six-figure salary while a woman in an ex-mining town in the American Midwest who has suffered real hardship is presently trying to live on less than the minimum wage. Now, of course, the premise makes all this quite difficult. She-Hulk, after all, follows Jennifer Walters, who is, in fact, a lawyer. The milieu in which she mixes is the same as that of the show's writers. But the fact they haven't found anything more interesting and universal to do with the story betrays a complete lack of imagination. You can, after all, bring the rich down, see Bruce Wayne. You can cross class divides. You can universalize the particular and tell a meaningful story. But the writers here have seen nothing more than an opportunity to put their own superficial gripes with luxury on the screen with a big budget and some truly questionable CGI. And in the MCU, shoehorning this tawdry irrelevance into a universe they had no hand in creating, in the story of which they have no interest whatever. The question I had since the series was announced was, who is this for? And the answer is pretty clear from the off, it's not for me, and it's probably not for you either, and it's not for anyone less materially comfortable than, say, Sarah Silverman. Rather, this show is for its writers, and it's for their exclusive social set, and it's for their fashionable friends. She-Hulk is the self-insert par excellence, a bafflingly particular and insufferably smug story for a small number of middle-class professional women who otherwise don't care about comics or the MCU and who have no real need or desire to laugh. What they want is social affirmation. And this is a massive problem for a comics-based show that is, well, supposedly at least, a comedy. That is quite enough to be going on with as an introduction, so I think it's about time we suffer the show itself, or what we've got of it so far, anyway. It begins with Jennifer Walters rehearsing her closing arguments for a case. She is praised by the other woman in the room over her male counterpart, whose parting line as he leaves the room is, You're gonna listen to a paralegal over another lawyer? Yeah. You didn't believe I was okay. this is <laughs> That was so good. So, yep, about 20 seconds in and we've already started with that. Though it's not as though it comes as a surprise, and hey, at least the show is doing everything it possibly can to make its protagonist seem like an unhinged metropolitan liberal fanatic from the off. She has a fucking Ruth Bader Ginsburg bobblehead, which is just all kinds of no. Bader Ginsburg, whatever we thought of her judgement and decisions, was a serious and thoughtful person. The kind of person who buys Bader Ginsburg bobbleheads, on the other hand, is an unhinged, empty-headed moron. We also get the first break of the fourth wall, which I gather is going to be an established theme in this series. Apparently it happened a lot in the earlier comics runs, and Jessica Gao, Jao, Gao, whatever, who pitched this show, and who I gather is leading on the writing and all the rest, had to be dissuaded from doing more of this. It's a very tricky thing to pull off. It makes it that much more important that we like the person addressing us, of course, and She-Hulk really doesn't do a good job of making Jennifer likeable. 
Oh shit, I just did a sexism. I totally forgot we're not supposed to want women to be likable. How very demeaning. Up the every sense of the term. But in a comedy, it means the jokes and the observations really do have to land because it can't rely on visual clues or for us to see the irony in events for ourselves. We have to see the comedy in the narrative as it is being relayed to us verbally by the protagonist. And this is tricky to accomplish. And then a third consideration. This is supposed to be part of the MCU, is it not? It's billed as an installment in Phase 4. So when she tells us we are watching this lawyer show, what exactly does this mean? Are we supposed to treat this as a documentary style production? Or is the meta humor breaking the fourth wall of the whole universe? If the latter, well, how exactly does that work? I'm glad they never properly tried integrating Deadpool into the MCU, not just because I find him distasteful and the meta humor boring, but because breaking the fourth wall of the universe reminds us we are outside all of it. It consciously breaks immersion and investment, not only in the events we are seeing now, but in the events we have already seen. What we are invited to ask would be Jennifer's quippy, quirky observations about Infinity War or Endgame. We had three whole phases to immerse ourselves in that, to inhabit that universe, but now we're kind of reminded that we were watching a screen all along and we're not really invested in any of it. The first fourth wall break is the show's excuse to go back in time and fill in Jennifer's story, as we see she and Bruce Banner, her cousin, on a road trip, deconstructing Captain America. Which I guess we just have to do now? And it's not entirely clear what the point of all this is, though I can think of precisely three explanations. One, it is exposition for its target audience, who haven't followed or cared about the MCU until this point. Two, it's an attempt to deconstruct the character for what passes as this show's humor, closing as it does with, of course, he was a virgin. And then three, it's an attempt to invert the mansplaining trope, because Bruce says, all you're doing is repeating what I've already told you about my friend and colleague, and we are invited to see how this might be annoying. And yeah, it is annoying, but not for the reasons the show thinks. Though happily, we are then swiftly interrupted as a spaceship appears on the road in front of them, and they crash in slow motion, though Mark Ruffalo appears to be having the time of his life. Jennifer cuts herself free and escapes from the upturned car, then she has to rescue Bruce, obviously, who is semi-conscious and bleeding. He gets some of his blood on her, and... and... and that's it. She's, she's a Hulk now. Uh, a couple of observations. A. This... I don't think this isn't what happens in the comics, is it? Doesn't he give her a transfusion or something? He doesn't have hyper-contagious green aids, but I suppose we can't have him rescuing her, can we? Because it's her show, and we can't possibly have heroes owe anything to anyone. B. How exactly does Hulk work now? Previously in these situations, Bruce has automatically turned into the Hulk in these kinds of threatening situations and so avoided damage. In the first Avengers film, he explains he once tried to shoot himself, Remember when we could have dark undertones in the MCU? But the big guy spit it out. I know a lot's changed between Bruce and the Hulk in the intervening period, but is it really now the case that the Hulk never appears unless specifically called upon to do so? Wouldn't he have emerged here during the crash and prevented this entire setup from happening? Well, maybe there is a reason for that. If it hadn't been for Phase 4 pumping out content and taking away the sense, I might actually have remembered this important information, but as it is... But as it is, well, who cares? None of it matters. Jennifer transforms and runs away, then wakes up at night in a forest near a motel where she finds a bathroom and cleans herself up, only to be interrupted by some sassy women who make domestic abuse jokes. Because I, I, are we allowed to do that now? One of them says, No judgments, but whoever did this to you does not care about you. And another says, You do not need him. Or her. Uh -huh. Or them. But you do and I have a nasty feeling I'm going to cringe so hard that I turn into the Hulk myself whenever there is dialogue in this show, because this is all such high-status, faux-progressive, witless fucking bilge. A, I am pretty sure we're not supposed to make rape jokes anymore, and if a man had done it, he would have been arrested. B, do you really think some randoms in a deadbeat bar in the arse end of nowhere are really gonna make progressive, non-binary, trans-inclusive quips off the cuff? They immediately set about giving her a makeover, because, uh, reasons? Is this not sexism? I thought we're supposed to be moving away from the idea that all women are is shallow, superficial, makeup bins. Anyway, they send her out into the night, where she's accosted by some horny males who flirt with her, and in the established rule of the modern MCU, she turns into She-Hulk and twats them. Or goes to twat them anyway, blink and you miss it, but the Hulk does in fact rugby tackle her out of the scene, 
and then we get a cutaway. Now, of course, this is nowhere near as bad as Captain Marvel and the Don, rest in peace, my friend, but honestly, the fact both instances are meant to appeal to that class of people who otherwise will complain about the normalization of violence and bigotry and all that jazz makes both scenes at least a little bit hypocritical. Maybe we shouldn't be normalizing punching people for the crime of flirting. She disappears and wakes up again at Bruce's place, a rather swanky seaside joint, and he's in the basement as Cuck Hulk. Uh, Hulk? Well, they called him Smart Hulk, so we'll guess we'll have to run with that. Ugh, way to remind us of one of the worst character decisions made in Endgame. Smart Hulk emerged as a beige and plot-convenient way to keep the Hulk out of the most impactful events he'd otherwise have been most useful in, thereby allowing Captain Marvel to take his place in destroying big spaceships and punching villains, and so denying the Hulk his well-deserved revenge moment following his beatdown in Infinity War. Having thus reduced him, because without those moments they really didn't know what to do with the character, we're now doubling down on it and we're carrying it on. The Hulk can no longer exist as a meaningful character, he is literally just here for old time's sake, harmlessly, and as a foil for other characters or an excuse for some exposition. I remember people complaining that, besides the 2008 film most people have just forgotten about, the Hulk never got his own mainline MCU entry, but well now he never will. He is destined to be this uh, borderline irrelevant side character with no violence, no aggression, no impetus to anger or to action. He is just tedious. There are more issues here, the first of which is that Smart Hulk occupies this really awkward middle ground between his two former characters that sacrifices the good aspects of both for the pitfalls of the other. Smart Hulk lacks the Hulk's animalistic aggression, his loudness, his rage, his physical personality. All these things have been swapped for Bruce Banner's equivalents. But he retains that slightly rubbery, stilted look of the Hulk, meaning we get Mark Ruffalo's flat and spaced out voice, but without his human face to actually convey emotion or add colour and expression to his pretty boring tone. Ruffalo needs his face to properly express himself, he is not a vocally gifted actor. The Hulk, partly out of the limits of CGI, needs his over-the-top expressions and his anger to convey his personality, but this awkward middle ground affords none of this. Also, the dialogue in the exposition is stilted as fuck. Smart Hulk explains that Tony built him this lab, but he has to add Tony Stark, because presumably the audience She-Hulk appeals to aren't familiar enough with the most iconic character in the MCU to have him on first name basis. It pays lip service, and it is no more than that, to Tony Stark's arc, Smart Hulk explaining that he used to joke he'd swing by one day and take it all back, but well. But then Jennifer doesn't give a flying fuck about any of this, so she just looks bored and distracted, and rather than any kind of reflection on what Bruce lost in Tony, she interjects with, wait, did we hit a spaceship? Smart Hulk says, yeah, wasn't that weird? But weird stuff just kind of happens when you're a Hulk. And by the way, we need to move the plot along because this is your show and not mine, so here's what just happened to you. You got a lethal dose of gamma radiation from my blood. She interrupts him then, saying, lethal, as in I'm gonna die? And he says, no, there's more to it than that, so she scolds him for pausing at the end of the sentence. Which, well, he didn't do that. You interrupted him. Remember, it was, it was like five seconds ago? when you stopped him from speaking? I thought we were supposed to not like it when people interrupted you whenever you are speaking, or is this another clever inversion of the norm? Anyway, she shares rare genetic factors with him apparently, which means she's a Hulk too. Not only different, but better though, naturally. She says, Because I'm better than you? Mm, it's just basically different. In a better way. In, in conclusion. And he kind of concedes the point. Uh, well, I mean, it's not hard to be a better character than Smart Hulk, but even so. Anyway, he uses some laser machine to destroy her blood samples because apparently it's so dangerous that they can't risk them getting out into the world, even though she's about to go out into the world and could feasibly be cap- I don't know. And she quips, bit dramatic. <laughs> Lol, a joke, such comedy, brilliant one-liner. I mean, don't get me wrong, the MCU has had way too many jokes for quite some time. It is about time we had something serious. The problem is, She-Hulk is billed as a comedy, and it clearly has aspirations in that direction. It is trying to make jokes, it's just that they're barely noticeable. So far, at least. I'm sure it'll get worse, though. 
Though it would be typical of the MCU if it accidentally reverted to serious writing in a show that tried to be a comedy, because they can't actually accomplish anything they're meant to anymore. Anyway, she nags him to take her back and he says he can't. She asks him to build her one of the devices he made to stop himself turning into the Hulk. I mean, I genuinely don't recall this being a thing, but I, I guess it was. Anyway, he says he can't, for reasons. So she's just going to have to be a Hulk and tough luck, sister. Now we're about a third of the way into the episode, and so far it just, well, it's it's not anything, really. Much of Phase 4 has this problem with weightlessness, either blowing up the stakes to make them incomprehensible, or reducing massive stakes by incessant, chirpy, out-of-place humor. But She-Hulk has thus far done neither of these two things, but it hasn't done anything else either. It's honestly for the best that I'm having to pause it so often to write this script, because if I hadn't, it would have already lost my attention. Nothing about this opening third of the first episode makes you give a fuck about it. At all. There is no point to it. It hasn't shown us why it needs to exist. All it's really accomplished is to make its protagonist seem both superfluous and irritating. What a great start! At breakfast next morning, Smart Hulk tells her she'll need to change the way she lives her life and quit her job and stay in hiding for years while she comes to terms with being a Hulk. He says it took him 15 years to control when he turns, but, well, this is She-Hulk we're talking about, and we know from the trailers that she ends up back in society pretty quickly, so I'm sure she'll get the hang of it instantly. She gets the hang of it instantly. Smart Hulk explains the transformations are triggered by intense emotional states. Specifically, it's triggered by anger and fear, to which she responds, Those are like the baseline of any woman just existing. Uh, is that a joke? I think it's meant to be a joke. I think it's a feminist joke. You know you can always tell a feminist joke because nobody laughs at it? Except maybe that one girl you know who's 36 and unmarried and works in PR in the city. And even then, she's probably just whooping and clapping and then will pause it in the next second so she can give you a mini lecture on the state of the modern woman. The thing is, I don't know many women, period, lol, see what I did there, who would find this particularly amusing. Because most women do not, in fact, live in perpetual states of anger and fear. Some do, to be sure. Some experience these things often, and far more often than they should have to. But to pretend there's nothing else to being a woman than this? Again, this is a niche experience for well-off city-dwelling women. The answer to that isn't that it's natural or even a universal imposition, it's that there is something quite specifically wrong about your life in particular, darling. And maybe you should look at the actual material causes of that, like the location you live in and the company you keep rather than harping on about vague and unfulfillable suggestions of system change and teaching our boys. Now, because this is supposed to be a comedy, I suppose the writers have just excused themselves of the responsibility to take anything about it seriously at all? Well, except the message, obviously. So when Bruce locks her in a cage with saws spinning and the walls closing in, we're not supposed to actually feel her stress and her anger and her fear because she doesn't really have any. It's just an excuse for some more jaunty dialogue. It's just, well, I mean, it's not funny, but it thinks it is. So we just look on bemused as she pretends to panic in a situation she doesn't actually feel the panic in. And then she instantly transforms and breaks out of the cage and has a shout. And then she's immediately fine again. 15 years for Bruce to get the hang of transforming, five minutes for Jen. You go, girl, you slay, She-Hulk. And now we have two unfortunately rendered CGI green things on the screen. We get just a snippet of seriousness as Smart Hulk explains what happens when people start seeing you as a monster. And this, well, it lasts maybe five seconds? But at least it is a faint memory of a time when everyone and everything wasn't just a walking, goofy, unfunny spoof. But the rest of the dialogue, of course, is as lightweight and flippant as is usual. When did this idea take hold, by the way? The reason people like the Hulk is because of the torment and the struggle, the rage, the tragedy, the battle for control of his own mind. His story is dark, it has serious and severe consequences. It's mingled with loss and limitation and sacrifice. But for She-Hulk? Well, she goes in as normal Jen and she emerges as big green Jen. And she's exactly the same, flippant, weightless, unfunny joker she's always been. What exactly are we meant to invest in here? She reluctantly accepts she'll need to learn from Smart Hulk how to de-transition. It is a real and tragic phenomena, you know. And he teaches her yoga, and she is, again, cracking jokes that don't land. Absolutely nothing about this show is designed to bring you in or to care about it. 
The best comedies have real, somber, and sometimes really heart-rending moments, but the idea of sincerity is alien to this show. So we get a montage of Smart Hulk teaching her the social cues and yoga and such, then they have a rock-throwing contest, and wouldn't you know she's better than him at most of all this stuff, and whenever she's not, well, she gets to outwit him so she's still the moral victor in the end. Then he pushes her off a cliff, and for just a second there is something to enjoy, but then she immediately jumps back up, and the sense of disappointment is palpable. They drink cocktails, apparently they're able to drink a lot without getting drunk, and as the critical drinker has pointed out, this really does defeat the object, unless you're drinking Lagavulin, because that is something you really do drink with a taste, but otherwise, what the fuck is the point? Anyway, let's try some praise. They have a conversation about what Jen will do with her life now, and Smart Hulk just assumes she will go on to be a superhero. She shatters this lazy assumption by stating she wants to go back to her day job, because she's trained and she's paid for it. And yeah, I don't mind this idea. I've said, or will say in a forthcoming video, out next week, folks, about how you can fix the MCU, that what it needs is more local heroes. Not superheroes on massive multiversal adventures saving the world every five minutes, but local heroes dealing with local, real, human and personal issues that are actually tangible and appreciable to the audience. You need to build from the ground up. This, this could make for an interesting premise. But it's shattered immediately by the revelation that the issues She-Hulk is dealing with are... Oh, well, I'd hate to mansplain for the dear lady, so let's have her lay it out for us in all its glory. Here's the thing, Bruce. I'm great at controlling my anger. Mm. I do it all the time. When I'm catcalled in the street, when incompetent men explain my own area of expertise to me, I do it pretty much every day because if I don't, I will get called emotional or difficult or might just literally get murdered. Oh, for fuck's sake. Now look, catcalling is dickish behavior. You shouldn't do it. I've actually been catcalled, actually, and I took it as a compliment, but I can see how it would be overbearing and irritating. Likewise, having people explain things to you that you know far more about than they do, that is also irritating. Likewise, being in situations where you are physically threatened, that isn't fun. But here's the thing. With the exception of catcalling, which I grant you is something women experience more than men, because most men are catastrophically ugly, the other two points are universal. Everyone deals with them, sometimes several times a day, irrespective of sex or gender. Hell, a quick glance through my comment section will reveal an awful lot of people, a tiny minority of the whole, most of you are lovely and intelligent people of course, but a tiny minority of people who insist on spouting off about things they know nothing about. My personal favourites are being told, all art and everything to do with it is subjective, by some random internet person. I did a master's dissertation in aesthetics. It is annoying when people boldly assert moronic things you know from experience, education and training to be wrong. Likewise, being told what homophobia is by straight people. That happens sometimes, that's also good fun. White people getting offended on behalf of minorities I've supposedly offended? Yep, yep, that's great as well. As for murder, men make up the vast, vast, vast majority of murderers, but also the vast, vast, vast majority of murderees. You are as likely, if not more likely, to be out at night in certain parts of certain cities and be attacked and get into fights and be killed if you are a man. All these things are objectively wrong and irritating, but they are also mundane and commonplace. You do not get any kind of special vagina medal for putting up with them just because you're a woman, as though they're things women and women alone put up with, or as though it is somehow more pressing to have to put up with them as a woman. That is bleating, that is self-infantilization. Like the genuinely funny female comedians, man the fuck up, darling. Entertainingly, she says if she doesn't put up with these things, she'll get called emotional. And then she gets angry and she turns into She-Hulk, thus proving that she does. Kind of shot yourself in the big green foot there, eh? But of course, she instantly transitions back in order to prove that she really can control all of this so much better and more easily than Bruce can. And that's the end of the training, which she didn't need anyway. And to top it off, she gets to slag him off. Oh, so you didn't wind up alone? Hiding away on some remote beach with no friends, no relationships, never seeing your family, and definitely not dealing with a decade's worth of trauma? Now, I know what the show is going for here, but the problem is that what it reveals is its own deficiencies. Her insults against Bruce are the reason people like him. He is complex, he is flawed, he's made sacrifices, he has suffered, he is traumatized. 
This is what makes for good characters. She, on the other hand, is so much more well-adjusted because all she's had to experience is... Uh, catcalling? And mansplaining. Do you see what you've done here, show? Do you see how you've just undermined your own message? Bruce has lived a serious life, he has done serious things, he has to live with serious consequences, he has had to work hard to attain his level of mental equilibrium. She, on the other hand, has lived a trivial life, she has trivial gripes, and doesn't bear anything but trivial consequences. She hasn't had to work as hard to attain her mental equilibrium. You can't lecture us about how oppressed and put upon women are, and in the next scene, unintentionally reveal that these things mean nothing because they are superficial as fuck. Brilliant writing, well done guys. This is what I meant earlier about it being offensive to women and to feminism. One of the few good reviews of this show I've seen so far, from a woman, makes the same point. This is LARPing, this is play acting, it's shallow and superficial posturing. Of all the real plights real women face, you've picked a character whose only trials and tribulations are being flirted with by someone she doesn't like and occasionally being scorned by a co-worker. Nobody except you cares about this. Nobody wants to know. I know women who've been through real hardship, and they would, they do, scoff at this kind of comfortable middle-class pantomime radicalism. Fucking hell, how did we go from Natasha Romanoff to this? Now, it's worth remembering that this is just the first episode and there is potentially a way to redeem this character. She-Hulk will have to be lowered, she will have to be leveled, reduced and knocked down. She will have to go through serious hardship, experiences that give her a new appreciation for what it is that Bruce has gone through and that teach her humility. She will have to be shown and she will have to realize that there are many, many, many more serious concerns in the world than fucking catcalling and mansplaining. She'll have to come to see Bruce in a new light, to realize how insanely lucky she has been to have such a comfortable existence until this point. But this is all highly unlikely to happen. I don't doubt they will pursue the reluctant superhero trope, but this will be done as myopically and selfishly as everything else in this show. Because for her experiences to redeem her character as it's been shown to us so far, she'll have to realize that she does, in fact, have to learn from Bruce, that she is not, in fact, oppressed and put upon by comparison, that the world is far bigger and darker and more serious than her life has so far shown it to be. And given they couldn't even have Bruce rescue her from the car crash, or show any agency in giving her her powers, as happened in the comics, the odds of them elevating him above her again are infinitesimally small. That would actually require care and attention, sympathy, empathy, values and respect, absolutely none of which these writers seem to possess. Anyway, she drives off in her car and runs Smart Hulk over and knocks him through some rocks. Um... Then she transforms and they have a fight, which looks terrible. And, well, I guess you can call it a score draw. She breaks the fourth wall again, and it is awkward, and it is shit. If anything, the show has suffered from having to downplay this aspect of its writing. If you are going to take this approach, you probably should pursue it more than this. You can't half ass it, because if you do that, it is jarring and not in a good way. They make up then, and she drives away. And we finish up the monologue begun at the beginning of the episode, which was only around 30 minutes ago in real life, but feels considerably longer. And we also get the first courtroom scene. You might remember that Jen is a lawyer in real life. Her asshole male colleague tells her not to screw it up. But before she has a chance to screw it up, we get a dramatic embodiment of the writer's realization that they can't write court scenes when the first such scene is interrupted by some bint who explodes through the wall, leading to She-Hulk transitioning and twatting her in the face. And that is the end of episode one. Save for a post credit scene, where they complete the Was Steve Rogers a Virgin discussion? <laughs> uh, LMAO, LOL, LMFAO, Ruffle. I'm, uh, no, I, did, I didn't laugh. Unusually for modern streaming service debuts, that's the only episode to have dropped on the opening day. 
And if I'm being very charitable, I'd say it maybe would have benefited from a two episode release because there is absolutely nothing in the first episode to invest in or to make you particularly want to stick with the story. Hell, it doesn't even have one yet. This was almost exclusively backstory, an origin story that can be condensed into she had a car crash and she got Hulk AIDS and she went home. What else is there to say? I'm sure there'll be some people who moronically pop up to argue, but there's only one first episode. Why are you judging the whole thing before it's finished? Yeah, okay, darling, I'm not judging the whole thing. I have no doubt it will get considerably worse than this. But first episodes are not redundant things you can simply discard in the name of the whole. The job of the first episode is to set the scene, to establish characters, to introduce the plot and the story, and to make you want to watch the rest of the show. This first episode accomplishes little, if any, of that. It feels like a cheap, frivolous afterthought, a studio that had a bit of cash lying around to throw at some irrelevant joke project. There's nothing to care about here. There's nothing to invest in. It generates no interest in a story it hasn't even started telling, not least because it gives us nothing to work with in that regard. What the fuck was the spaceship? Will we even see it again? Who was the random woman villain at the end? Will we see her again? Does anybody care? Could you have done anything with this premise? Well, maybe. I must admit, there is an entire class of derivative comics heroes I can't envisage myself ever being interested in, chiefly the female clone versions of established male heroes. She-Hulk, Batgirl, Supergirl, etc. There are brilliant female comics characters and brilliant female movie characters that we've already seen on screen, and their screen iterations are the ones I'm familiar with, like Black Widow, Scarlet Witch, Storm and Jean Grey from the X-Men. But the risk with clone heroes is that they become entirely derivative and tell variations of stories already established male heroes have already been through, offering little that is unique on top of it. So sure, having a reluctant superhero who lives a normal life and practices law, well that's not a bad premise, you could do stuff with it. A lot of it has already been done, it's called Daredevil, and he is also an MCU character and already established. So it's hard to see how She-Hulk can chart new ground to tell a proper story with this as its premise that hasn't already been told and told better with a unique character. What differentiates these premises, She-Hulk and Daredevil, is, from the looks of it, solely the gender question? The gender question alone. And so I'm doubtless going to be very annoyed to have people popping up in my comments, femsplaining that the only reason I like one but not the other is that I hate women and I'm obsessed with gender or sexual politics, and no, I don't and I'm not. Women are great. I share more, um, experiences than most men do with most women. Always got on well with them. Really sympathize, empathize, in fact. Nothing against that species whatsoever. Some of the brightest and cleverest and nicest people I know. And as just mentioned, there are some great female characters, so I have no principled objection to them, even the strong variety. Ellen Ripley, Sarah Connor, Natasha Romanov, all great, all strong in their own unique ways, all well written, all full of character, all placed within actual stories, rather than women's studies lectures. It would appear, however, that She-Hulk is going to try and spend much more time on the interpersonal aspect, and this isn't promising, because that is amongst its weakest areas. Jen and She-Hulk aren't likeable or entertaining characters, their dialogue and interactions are the most superficial, lazy and hackneyed things, with the only effort expended being in repeating lazy sub-feminist quips about the patriarchy. There is, so far, little real strife, little by way of trial and tribulation, no character forming experiences. Whenever the show has hinted at these, it has immediately pivoted to fourth wave talking points and buzzwords and cheap gripes. Now you might well say that, as with Ms. Marvel, of course you don't like it, it's not meant for you. To which the obvious rejoinder is, well, who is it made for, and why? In the first place, Ripley, Connor, Romanov, Storm, Grey, Wanda Maximov, these characters are all universally appreciable, with stories playing on universal themes and deep characters demanding universal sympathies. They may not be made for you, but they're not not made for you. She-Hulk, by contrast, is insanely particular about its audience. The problem is, the insanely particular audience it seems to be reaching for is a incredibly small and select and b, the audience least likely to watch it, or indeed to have watched any of the preceding entries in a universe this story is nominally placed in. Hence the expository callbacks to Tony, oh you know Tony Stark, that guy, and my friend Captain America who did XYZ. The best stories play on universal themes and ideas, 
But that is not to say they generate universal interest. There will always be people who don't like Star Wars or who don't like The Lord of the Rings, who don't like comics. If you were to draw a Venn diagram, the center point between these three would be upper middle class urbanite millennial professional women who have very little taste anyway. And stories have survived without them because in the grand scheme of things, they are a tiny audience who would much rather nod along sagely while watching The Good Wife, flick the bean reading Fifty Shades to make up for their own shallow sex lives, and clap at Amy Schumer's vagina jokes and pretend to find Tina Fey's Oscars monologues funny. There is plenty of media catering for them because they have an outsized influence in corporate boardrooms and are overrepresented now in studio writers' rooms. But like, for example, Star Trek Discovery, the apotheosis of progressive niche feminist myopia, their experiences and wants and cares are so far removed from those of the mass audience, male and female, that the shows they produce alienate infinitely more people than they bring in. Not least because, being comfortable middle-class urbanite millennial professional feminists who have never known anything but comfort, their idea of strife and so their idea of character formation is so insanely petty and reductive and shallow that nobody but them could possibly have any sympathy for the characters they're writing. If any broader lesson than that can be taken from She-Hulk, it's that it embodies the underlying problem with Phase 4 of the MCU, which is that it's entirely pointless. One of the few remarkable things about it is that it's the first show to have out and out declared itself to be a comedy. Yet not only is it the least funny entry, it's also the one with the lowest number of jokes per minute. Which would be a welcome change, except that, having declared itself a comedy, it hasn't even pretended to care about the other things that non-comedy entries have at least to pay lip service to, like story and characterization. The best that can be said of the other Phase 4 entries is that they didn't do enough story and characterization, and they did too many jokes. The best that can be said of She-Hulk is that it does too few jokes, and no story or characterization, and it doesn't even pretend to care. Look at it this way. If She-Hulk didn't have its name, if it weren't attached to an established brand, if it weren't ostensibly part of the MCU and Phase 4, would anyone even have heard of it? Would anyone be interested in it at all? Would anyone care? Would it even have been made? The answer is no. No, it really wouldn't. But this is the way of things with Disney now. Having no ideas about what to do with the MCU, it's essentially a writing shop for jobbing scribblers looking to transition to the screen, benefiting from a studio with more money than sense. Warner and Discovery is currently experiencing the sharp end of Mr. Zaslav's knife, and had Disney poached him instead, this weird experiment in giving squillions of dollars to talentless people with bad ideas would have come to an end already. This will likely be the last video I do on this topic because, frankly, I really doubt I can stomach following this series through. If it becomes Batwoman-level cringe, well, I might come back to it because I'm a sucker for the so bad it's good variety of entertainment. But given we've got House of the Dragon coming up and Rings of Power and Andor, each of which I intend to give my full attention, I can see She-Hulk is going to be swiftly relegated to an irrelevance and for most of you people who are more sensible than I am and don't have to cover this stuff in an attempt to make a living, it probably already is. But in case this is the last time I get to comment on She-Hulk, a quick final word before we close. We have, I hope, had some fun with this show. We've had a few laughs, we've told a few jokes. What a shocking idea about a comedy, I know. Besides that being enjoyable in its own right, it is really the only approach to take with a show that is just so bad you have to laugh, or else you'd probably have to cry, or at least to rage. But there is a serious point to be made. Inevitably, the first simping morons have begun to pass any and all criticism of this show as being motivated by sexism and misogyny. They draw links between the reactions to female leads and most recent MCU entries, She-Hulk, WandaVision, Multiverse of Madness, Love and Thunder, Captain Marvel, and they say, look, the fandom menace hates all these women, and they don't criticize the male heroes in the same way, therefore they must be chauvinistic bigots. Now this, of course, as you and I know, is utter horseshit. The fact so many recent entries have objectionable female leads has nothing to do with the sex or gender of those leads, and everything to do with how they are written. If you want female heroes to be appreciated in the same way as male heroes have been, you have to write female leads as competently as the male heroes were once written. You need to give them real stories, real struggles, depth, strife, flaws. You need to treat them as characters that deserve to exist in their own right, 
and not just as props that you need to exist in order for you to peddle your pet socio-political gripes and issues. If you want people to like your female hero, a good start might be, don't write her to be a complete bitch. Don't pretend that catcalling is morally equivalent as a crime to wiping out half the fucking universe. Don't pretend that being mansplained to is an issue even worthy of consideration at all. Never mind pretend it represents a character-defining struggle along the lines of Tony Stark's sacrifice, Bruce Banner's trauma, and Captain America's sense of duty and purpose. It isn't the audience's fault if you're writing awful female characters, it's your fault, you scribbling hacks. The stories you tell and the characters you put them in do a disservice to the existing audience. For a show that complains about misogyny, I really cannot think of a better way to create misogynists than by showing young men She-Hulk. Because if your moral paragon is a shallow, self-centered, arrogant, egotistical, man-hating super slag, then your message is that all men are either bastards or complicit in bastardly behavior, well how the hell do you expect your male audience to react to that? Like the Bible reliably producing atheists, modern feminist writers create the very thing they rail against. But also, and to go back to the point raised near the beginning, it does a disservice to your female audience, to the people you pretend to represent. Men and women, real people, are infinitely more complex, nuanced, funny, cheerful, ironic, confused, liberated, oppressed, stoic, emotional, bold and afraid than the characters you are creating to represent them. To reduce women to fear and anger, to a fragile species that can't handle even minor social transgressions and impoliteness, is to infantilize the women you claim you're championing. So it's not just men who are and who should be depressed and angered by shows like She-Hulk. It's women who've actually led difficult lives, real lives, and who have real-world experience. Women who aren't privileged enough to earn hundreds of thousands of dollars and live in swanky apartments holding down liberal arts majors and careers in the city and the media. Men are let down by your hatred of them, of course, but women are let down by your hubris in pretending you can speak for them. There is far more that separates the writers of She-Hulk from the experiences of most women than there is that separates most women from most men. Is it possible this show will be saved? Well, I mean, technically, yes, but is it probable? Absolutely, fucking lutely it is not. Because nobody involved in it seems to have an ounce of introspection, an iota of social awareness, or a scintilla of social conscience. So I guess it's kind of lucky that we've been able to find ways to take the piss out of She-Hulk. Because if it weren't so bad as to be funny, it would have no redeeming features, whatever. But that's it for now. But before you go, we did a live stream review over at Mr. Brown Alliance, and some of us at least were able to have a little bit of fun taking the piss out of this show. Some of us, on the other hand, found it all a little bit too much, but the link for that is in the description. Do go check it out. For this channel, the Stranger Things or How to Save the MCU video will hopefully be out this week, uh, and then of course we have House of the Dragon, which will probably have aired on the day this video goes live, so rest assured I'm already working on a review for that. No rest for the wicked. The final Obi-Wan Kenobi video is of course still in the works. I do hope this will be out around the same time as Andor goes to air. It is just a little bit tricky doing multi-hour projects alongside the rest of the coverage and indeed the day job. The next big one for us though is of course going to be Rings of Power. If you liked the Kenobi videos, I care at least as much about the Lord of the Rings and I am thoroughly looking forward to seeing the second of my two favorite creations butchered by moral cretins, whose only link with art is that it shares three letters with retard. See you next week, folks. So, what has been the achievement of my essay? It's been to make sexier women try harder to amuse me. Well, that was my whole plan to start off with.